So is uh, Dr. Sushmita there? Yes, Sushmita. Shushmita. Okay. Okay, a uh, very good evening and uh, I'm Amita Maheshwari and uh, we'll, you know, this is the last session of this uh, three days long wonderful um, academic feast and I'm sure we all, you know, want to sleep early tonight. So the, I'll keep it, uh, you know, very short and all these slides have been prepared by Sushmita Burton. She's a gynec oncologist at uh, NICRH. Is she there? Uh, Sushmita, do you want to start or shall I go ahead? Okay, so let me invite uh, panelists uh, for this panel discussion. So we have um, uh, Dr. Jaya Ghosh, uh, Dr. Rupinder Sekhun, Dr. Uh, Goodman, Dr. Bhavna Rai, Dr. Santosh Menon. I think all have already been introduced. Uh, professor Begum Arukia Anbar, she is professor and head of the department at NICRH and Professor Janatul Pertos, she is professor of gynec oncology at BSMMU. So I hope uh, all are here. Hello. Okay. So let me start uh, with the case. Uh, a young Nali Paris uh, lady uh, was under investigation for primary infertility, uh, diagnosed with endometrial hyperplasia. Uh, and she is a known case of polycystic ovarian disease, married for uh, nine years, PMI was 30, ECOG performance status good, clinical examination was essentially normal. Yeah. Uh, her transvaginal ultrasound showed endometrial polyp and AMH was 7.5 and basic infertility workup was done and husband's semen analysis was normal. This is her ultrasound report uh, which showed thickened uh, endometrium here. So my question is, uh, is Dr. Rupinder there? Yep. Uh, yeah. So uh, Dr. Rupinder, when you have this kind of ultrasound report, uh, what, what next would you do in a, in a 34 year old lady who is under investigation for infertility and she's a known case of PCOS? So, uh, she has to first come to me because generally, yes, we we, yeah. Yeah, yeah, because it's such a patient, <laughs> she will not come to me, okay. no, because as a gynae oncologist, she will first go to, a. um, are the gynecologist, gynecologist. fertility expert yeah. yeah a fertility expert who will uh, more often than not will just put in a, uh, uh, put in a pipel or something and take out some endometrial sample and uh, have some kind of a report and if that report says atypia of any kind whether it is complex hyperplasia with atypia or just simple hyperplasia with atypia then she might send her to me so when she comes to me with this sort of a report then I would much rather do a hysteroscopy DNC for her and uh, then get a more specific report as to is it only hyperplasia or does it have any element of invasion in it and then take it from there. So is the hyperplasia. So is AK there, uh, Dr. Goodman? Sorry. Uh, Dr. Shana, is Dr. Goodman there? No, ma'am. <clears throat> Goodman, ma'am, is unavailable. No, okay, so uh, okay, so uh, my question, I think, same question to Dr. Janatul. Uh, um, so, uh, if you know, get a, a report of endometrial atypical hyperplasia on triple biopsy, would you be happy or would you want what Dr. Pinder has suggested a hysteroscopy and biopsy? Thank you, Dr. Amita. Actually, um, she has some risk factors, PCO, obesity is there. And um, if I get biopsy, like uh, biopsy report, like a typical endometrial hyperplasia with, with atypia, then uh, in this case, in, in our context, it is actually to prepare again for hysteroscopy and guided biopsy is very difficult. So I, I think in our context, better we can review the slide. As there is a associated endometrial hyper uh, endometrial cancer in 
40% or 42% cases. So um, uh, rather uh, doing of uh, endometrial biopsy, I want to review the slides. Okay, so uh, she underwent uh, laparoscopy and hysteroscopy and uh, uh, ovarian drilling was done uh, for bilateral PCOS and there was a polyp which was uh, removed and sent for histopathology and, uh, and some of us anticipated the endometrial biopsy here is hyperplasia with atypia and uh, slides were reviewed at oncology center and which confirmed the diagnosis of atypia and there was some concern about well differentiated endometrioid adenocarcinoma so my question is dr uh, santosh manan uh, yes santosh hi santosh hi, so hi, hi so if in this such kind of situation hi. would you be happy having a tiny biopsy pipel biopsy or would you, uh, you know, want a larger chunk of tissue to be a little bit short between, you know, carcinoma or atyp atypical hyperplasia? Yes, we would need a better biopsy with a good relation of the glands with the stroma and how the glands are arranged with each other. How is the uh, density of the glands, whether they back to back, fused, cribriform. So those things would be better seen in, in, a, in a more uh, uh, voluminous curatage rather than a small uh, biopsy. So that's a, and this is a very difficult field always where you have endometrial hyperplasia and when it becomes a well differentiated in the carcinoma, there is no clear cut cutoff uh, right. criteria for that. But in general, in younger patients, this is a common report which you put up that hyperplasia, which is bordering on well differentiated in the carcinoma grade one. Right. So I think I uh, tend to agree that in this situation, a formal, even not hysteroscopy or a, a formal uh, endometrial biopsy is needed, uh, just pipil biopsy may not be adequate. The other question is, uh, you know, we know that she's a case of infertility with this kind of report. Uh, Dr. Rupinder, would you be happy having this report or would you want additional information on the tissue at this point? Yeah, definitely, we would want additional information uh, in imaging as well as uh, from our pathology colleagues. Because uh, we have a lot of discussion on molecular uh, yeah. uh, markers <laughs> on tissue, so what all uh, we expect from pathologists at this juncture? So, 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 so to start with, the simplest is P53. First, let's have that out of the way. Right. So, even though it is a well differentiated endometrioid carcinoma, and only five percent of these are actually um, uh, express P53, but first, let's have a P53. So, because she infertility and if we are looking at conservative management let's be very sure that yes we can actually go in for conservative management and then of course an mr uh, uh, report which shows that there is uh, no um, myometal invasion and also to tell us to you know define the lesion is the whole endometrium involved is there a just a focus of disease and what exactly it is, that is very important to know because uh, uh, since you have put forward infertility as a primary uh, deciding factor, so we need to have all this uh, information. Okay. So, um, uh, Dr. Rukia, um, uh, Dr. Rupendra said P53, at least we want from pathologists. Any additional information? Um, is she there? Or maybe Dr. Janakul can answer. Yes, um, regarding the additional information, in this case, um, I want to uh, see the status of uh, PR receptors uh, because um, my aim of treatment is uh, to, to give her progesterone, high dose progesterone. So I will uh, do, uh, suggest to do progesterone receptor. And also uh, I want to do uh, serum uh, a tumor marker like CA125 and HE4 because I want to exclude the myo invasion. And uh, of course, counseling of the patient is very important because uh, uh, patient should understand that this is not a standard treatment. And, uh, uh, and also I should search for any contraindication to medical treatment. Thank you. Yeah. So, good. Uh, Dr. Bafna there, I may I request you to join, Dr. Bafna, if you are still around. Yeah, Amita, I, 
I'm okay so yeah so you because you delivered a very nice uh, uh, lecture on this topic so uh, the consensus is that we need p53 and the pr on the tissue but any additional information you think we should be be asking for mmr although she is a you know the etiology most probably it's pcos yeah. related Yes, Amit, according to the recent uh, guidelines uh, given by SGO, all the patients should have molecular typing. I mean, more cancer And, and uh, as far as ER and PR are concerned, uh, normally uh, most of the patients are ER and PR positive. And that's one way to... I think there is some background noise, I think. Yeah, I think if Somebody is speaking in between, actually. Yeah, okay. I think uh, ER and PR receptor status, uh, normally I don't do it. Hey, Baba, so, India, uh, doctor, you can see Bangladesh, you can see what you say. India, you can Okay. I think some of the participants have to mute themselves, perhaps. Yeah. So you may, you may do ER and PR status, uh, but normally it may not be required because generally grade one tumor are supposed to be ER and PR positive. Yeah, but I think we would do because generally they are supposed to be P53 negative also, but we are really looking at that small yeah, percentage yeah. where P53 may be mutant and ERPR may not be so strongly I positive. Think right. And if uh, facilities available, especially if there is any family history or if it is not a clear cut case of PCOS, I think uh, we should also look for MMR um, uh, IHC. So that's, uh, I think, if facilities available, we should do. So anyway, in this patient, after having a discussion and counseling the patient, uh, she was very keen to have uh, fertility preservation. And as Dr. Janatul said, a detailed counseling was done. So what options does she have for fertility preservation? I mean, uh, what, what treatment would be offered to her? Can I mention? Amita, so, uh, I think MR is subsequently MR was uh, not did not show any myometrial invasion. It was limited to endometrium, and it's grade one disease. Uh, uh, ERPR status is not here, but uh, let's presume that she's P fifty three uh, non mutant and ERPR positive. Non mutant. No, we actually progested on progestin therapy. High dose progesterone, and and um, in 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 our country in Bangladesh, unfortunately, uh, LNG IUS is not available. Mm, uh, so in in our context, I think high dose uh, magistral acetate or medroxy progesterone acetate can be given. Okay, so we'll come to uh, treatment details a little later. So these are. Cases, you know, indications for fertility preservation in a uh, um, lady with endometrial uh, carcinoma. So grade one or low grade essentially limited to endometrium or with minimum myometrial invasion may be uh, uh, allowed. Of course, there shouldn't be any metastasis and no medical contraindication to uh, high dose progestogen and patient should be fertile otherwise. So that's also important. We have to do basic uh, infertility workup. Um, uh, 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 you know about uh, uh, HE4 and CA125, uh, we routinely do not do because if MR is not showing any myo invasion, it's unlikely. And then, you know, CA125, again, we know it's a very non-specific marker, but that may be, you know, if you are, that's your practice, I think uh, that's a fair thing, but we do not do. And I'm sure Dr. Rupinder, do you uh, 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 yeah. ask for yeah. CA125 yeah. and HE4? as a marker for myometrial invasion? No, no, not at all. It, it okay. does not uh, tell us this. Uh, one more point, uh, Amata, if I may please add over here, that we always take an extra risk sign from the patient after we finish counseling them, because we explain to them that conservative management is really not the standard of care. And it is, they are as much at risk of progression as uh, any other patient, and they are taking the chance and we are with them, but they have very, to understand, yeah. yes, that they're taking a very valid of, point. Yeah, uh, and that, that definitely uh, there is a definite chance of progression in spite of giving them progestins or whatever else we might choose to give them. Right. The next question is, uh, is MR mandatory? Can we uh, do without it or is it mandatory? So 
डॉक्टर रुकिया इफ शी इज देयर प्रोफेसर और इशी देयर डॉक्टर शाहना Okay. Uh, I think Dr. Janatul or Dr. Bafna. Yeah, I think uh, better to have a contrast enhanced MRI scan. Very important to rule out. My Any MRI alternative MRI. to suppose MR is not available? MRI is not available. Then I think you can do transvaginal sonography. In I think right. good hands, expert hands. I think it is as good as MRI scan. Right. So the problem with ultrasound nowadays is to get a good sonologist, someone who is really interested. The expertise is so important there. I know. And yes. with you know with advancement in radio 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 diagnosis, I think people are really not so much interested in doing a transvaginal ultrasound. So yeah, I much rather see the pictures rather than to find them. That's true. I think we all prefer MRI when uh, I mean if there is a situation where MR is not available. then an uh, a tra- tv is done by an expert is okay but otherwise mri is the preferred modality here and this is one of the indication mr will tell about uh, the depth of myometrial invasion i mean myometrial invasion if any cervical extension and also about ovaries because we also have to remember that some 8 to 10% patients may have synchronous ovarian um, meds or uh, uh, ovarian cancer so Uh, that's that for all these reasons mri is the preferred imaging modality in this situation so this is but, our but mri dr Am- dr amita one thing um, in our low resource sitting where the mri facility is not there and patient uh, lives in a remote area there uh, can uh, we suggest tbs because tbs has accuracy uh, in detect the cervical extension it has a good accuracy 90% but in myometrial invasion accuracy uh, is not so good but can we uh, suggest tbs in the remote areas when patient cannot come to a tertiary level hospital right so the remote area the only concern will be do if we have an expert uh, sonologist who can do a good quality tbs is all right otherwise i think we should not compromise on imaging um, and we should try to get a mri so uh, yes i mean if expert tbs it's equivalent to mri but if it is not done by an expert i think then uh, you know it can compromise uh, patient's uh, treatment and survival yeah. okay so this is her mri and uh, which essentially showed disease limited to uh endometrium there was no myometrial invasion cervix vagina uh, everything was all right and there were no lymph- lymphadenopathy so other thing is mri also can tell about lymph nodes so uh this was her uh, immunohistochemistry uh er pr positive and negative for p53 m- and mmr uh, proficient so here is the patient with you what is the treatment option for her now Rupender, what will you offer to her if she is with you? We would give her give a progesterone, of course. Um, okay. What's your preferred progesterone? Yes. And choice of progesterone. We, yeah, we'll. Uh, I'll just uh, tell you that. But and before we uh, actually give her the uh, treatment, we would also like to have a LFT with us as well as a lipid profile. She is thirty four years old. so it's important that you know we have all of this and we all also a coagulogram and then uh, we generally give uh, magestrol acetate or uh, magestron we start with the a lower dose and uh, let her take that for about uh, uh, a week and then we call her back and then give her the full dose so we start with 80 mg and uh, subsequently we uh, Uh, get on to one sixty because a few patients know they are not able to tolerate the hormone itself. So in such a situation, it would be pointless giving her any kind of hormonal therapy. Right. I think we also follow the same. We start with lower dose uh, for uh, you know ten to twelve days, and then call the patient back to see their compliance to treatment and any toxicity. Uh, Doctor Bafna, you have uh, I think good experience yeah, with uh, so. these been, cases. Yeah, I think so. I have been applied. Applied. Amita, I have been using a combination of uh, oral and intraoral devices. Uh, right. I think that would reduce uh, the requirement of oral persistence, uh, and you should be able to get away with smaller dose of oral persistence. Uh, maybe around one sixty should be enough. 
What I've seen is sometimes uh, patients do not respond to 160 mg, and they may need 240 to 320 mg. So with the use of intraultrine LNG device, uh, I think most of them respond to uh, the therapy. So I think a combination of uh, LNG device and oral uh, magistral acetate, I would prefer. Okay. So what Dr. Janathul said, apparently in uh, um, uh, Bangladesh, it's not available. But uh, in the morning, someone mentioned that it's available in the sense you can get it from India. So um, uh, where it is available. It is not okay. con consistent. Sometimes okay, it's can... not consistent. Yeah, okay, yeah. So what about GNRH, Chanala? Would you like to add uh, that also she's a case of PCOS? Any experience? We I do actually give them GNRH also um, and also try to tell them to reduce weight, although on progesterone they tend to put on weight, but uh, also important to you know target their basic uh, problem. And also, maybe also should do a thyroid function test uh, before starting the treatment. Yeah, okay. So, okay. any any experience with hysteroscopic resection uh, prior to start? Doctor Rupinder mentioned about uh, you know removing the polyp and all, but uh, any experience with hysteroscopic resection to reduce the bulk of uh, disease? Yes, I, mean, I think most of the patients are referred by infertility experts. Uh, and right. Already done. Uh, hysteroscopy and whenever there is a polyp is there, it's better to excise the polyp, I think, uh, uh, and uh, debulk the tumor so that the dose of uh, hormonal therapy is reduced. So resection is always, I think, preferred, I think. I personally, somehow, you know, we had uh, two patients, in fact, who had resection outside and one of the cases such a bad uh, uh, outcome, she had disseminated disease, a grade one tumor. I was wondering whether, you know, hysteroscopic resection uh, uh, opened channels and it led to dissemination of uh, tumor. But personally, I'm not really a great fan of hysteroscopic resection. Um, but of course, there are some reports uh, suggesting that hysteroscopic resection can be uh, done to reduce uh, the tumor uh, bulk before starting medical treatment. And as we discussed, the preferred modality or preferred drug is magistral acetate. The dose is uh, 160 to 320 milligram divided doses. We get in 40 milligram and 80 milligram tablets. Or you can also use medroxyprogestrogen. Again, a very high dose for general gynecologists to remember. These are not like 10, 20 milligram. You have to really give high dose. And we do get 50, 100 and 150 milligram tablets of medroxyprogestrogen acetate. So these are the drugs. And... Now, as Dr. Bafna mentioned about um, uh, if available, uh, uh, along with oral, alone, no, but along with oral, uh, LNG, IUD can also be used. And it has shown to reduce the dose of uh, oral progestogen and also has shown to increase the effectiveness. And of course, GNRH analog, uh, I do actually use uh, in cases of PCOS. Okay. So this is uh, uh, some uh, review um, uh, what Sushmita has done and a study of 28 patients. This is essentially to show the response rates uh, after six months of progestogen in carefully selected patients. Complete regression can be expected in up to 80 or 90 percent, persistent in around 10 percent, and progressive disease in 3.6 percent. So this is also important when counseling the patient. Never give them 100 percent guarantee because there is a substantial uh, or at least certain risk of disease progression while on uh, medical management. And conception rates also, you know, it's very small study, but um, uh, 40, to, 40 to 30 to 60 percent patients are able to conceive um, with after medical management. So this patient, she received magistral 160 milligram and advised to come uh, for follow-up after three months. And what do you do at follow? Uh, so, Dr. Okay, yeah. Rukia is there. Okay, so yeah, we were. Uh, let's see. Dr. Rukia, are you there? Yes, yes. I think she might be muted. Muted. No, she's there. Okay, she just needs to unmute herself. Amita, do you hear me? 
Yes. Yeah, yeah. Now, huh, finally, I can hear you. In our country, it is very difficult to manage this kind of cases because of um, uh, the uh, patient mostly dealt in, deal in sub, uh, infertility specialist and OBG even is well specialist. But uh, when we got the patient, most of the time the patient are in advanced stage. So uh, we need to careful follow up and surveillance because before surveillance we need to counsel the patient and also her husband. Because the uh, one, one in one hand it is a problem of subfertility. On the other hand, the uh, uh, fear of uh, cancer both uh, coexist at the same time. But and the patient uh, used to go to different uh, subfertility infertility specialist also oncology specialist. So they became biased. So in uh, our country, most of the time we in our center have advanced. Uh, endometrial cancer, no scope of fertility sparing most of the time. If we got one or two, we start use uh, magistral acetate, but uh, there, there is some problem of surveillance. Most of the patient lost to follow up. Yeah, I think that's very valid point you made. You know, surveillance or follow up is so important in these patients. So if patient is not reliable to come for follow up, I think it's best not to put them on um, this kind of treatment because otherwise it's a highly curable uh, stage of the disease. So if patient is, you know, reliable to come for follow-up, then only we will start uh, medical management and uh, follow-up is uh, um, either an MRI or transvaginal uh, ultrasound and an endometrial biopsy. So in this patient at three months follow-up, uh, the endometrial biopsy showed endometrial hyperplasia with atypia. So what takes now? You know, she has taken three months of uh, high dose progesterone and it was 160 milligram. Dr. Bafna? Yeah, Amita. He has persistent Amita, disease Amita, at three months. Yeah, Amita, as I mentioned in my morning talk, uh, that uh, this kind of reporting is very common, extremely common. When you do a TV scan, you'll find that endometrium is thinned out. But when you do a curatus, the report comes as endometrial hyperplasia with ATPA. And most of the time, I feel that this is because of uh, hormone effect, which causes uh, edema of the endometrium and uh, also uh, hormone-induced atypia. And uh, if at all you have used LNG uh, intrauterine device, intrauterine device by itself can produce inflammation and inflammatory atypia. So many times, uh, this kind of atypia are not true atypia. They are uh, just uh, uh, hormone-induced and uh, IOD induced ATPA. But I think uh, the fertility specialist uh, will not do any kind of uh, treatment for this. Exactly. Uh -huh. So, Santosh, do you agree? And how difficult it's for uh, you as a pathologist to differentiate between progesterone induced changes versus, um, uh, you know, um, well differentiated carcinoma or ATPA? The thing uh, I partly agree with uh, Bafna sir here. The point is uh, progesterone action on endometrium is to make it into a secretory endometrium. The idea is that it makes it more secretory. In the sense, the glands look secretory, the, the stroma becomes decidualized. So that's the change which we see when you give high-dose progesterone to the patient. And that should be seen uh, uh, under the microscope. So there are many cases like this typical case. Uh, many of the cases turn out that they don't show the uh, secretory changes. They don't show uh, secre uh, decidualized uh, uh, stromal changes. And they continue to show the same hyperplastic changes where the glands are back-to-back -back arranged and they show ATPA. So that uh, under the microscope, if I say ATPA, I have to label as ATPA. So the, if I don't see the secretory changes, I'm going to call it a, uh, endometrial hyperplasia. Right. Dr. Santosh, how about uh, intrauterine device induced ATPA? Sir, we don't see so many. Dr. Amita, we don't put so many IUD devices, do we? We do put, but I think we have not got report uh, we do actually have cases. Of course, we don't write in uh, the form always that it is, you know, so patient I mean, has IUD. Doctor, sir, by this, it, inflammatory ATPA is, is not very difficult to pick in the sense there would be a lot of inflammation first and foremost. Uh, inflammation is not a common thing in endometrium per se, in, uh, unless until it's a breaking endometrium of a normal menstrual cycle, you don't see inflammatory cells. So if there's a lot of inflammatory cells and then you can uh, probably clearly pick out the inflammatory ATPA. So my major thing is progesterone should induce secretory changes in the endometrium, and anything which is not secretory looking, we look at more carefully whether the endometrial hyperplasia still persists or not. 
Okay, Santos, just yesterday okay. I, had, uh, I had a report, actually, the same patient uh, reported by two pathologists. Uh, one has reported as endometrial hyperplasia with ATPR. Mm -hmm. And same slide was reviewed at Kilpaya Hospital. And they said nothing, everything is normal. Sir, this is a common mistake. I'll tell you what happens. Uh -huh. So when the secretory gland, because these glands are very hyperplastic, they are very close to each other. And okay. when progesterone induces secretory changes in them, they still continue many times to be close to each other yes. and a little back to back. But the new the cell cellular morphology is important. Okay. You should look at the secretory changes. So that's something called a secretory hyperplasia you find sometimes. Okay. okay. So that is a change which is induced by progesterone. And that basically means that the endometrium is taking uh, effect of uh, progesterone, hydrosprogesterone. And that okay. should not be called as endometrial hyperplasia. Endometrial hyperplasia is a hyperesterogenic uh, yeah. uh, thing which is happening. Santosh, you are working in a cancer hospital, probably you are an expert. Uh, but sometimes, no, you get all, all kinds of reports. Uh, as far as yeah. That's why we need uh, Santosh. Uh -huh. <laughs> yeah. Dr. Amita, in, the, yeah. in, the, Amita, in this case, actually, uh, the patient is obese, BMI is more, and she's a known case of PCOS. I think uh, treatment with 160, it could be suboptimal for her. And it is better. Uh, we can uh, increase uh, the dose up to 320 milligram. And we can also wait for another three months because the recommendation, uh, uh, recommended average duration of treatment is six months. So after at six months, that is after three months uh, of getting high dose treatment, we can do another uh, follow-up DNC. And if the uh, uh, result of the histopathology report shows that there's complete response, no atypia, then uh, she can try to conceive. Uh, um, conception can be encouraged. But after, uh, at six months, if uh, there is progressive disease uh, or no response at all, then she should be counseled and definitive treatment should be given for her. Yes, I think Dr. Rupendra, do you agree with uh, Dr. Janathan? Actually, uh, Omita, I would like to say that uh, magistral will cause an uh, obesity. The BMI may again increase uh, by this high dose of magistral. That's a concern whenever we put them on a high dose of progesterone. You have to really tell them to strictly uh, monitor their weight. And that's where I think uh, adding uh, LNG is useful. It reduces systemic toxicity, although alone it's not recommended. Yeah, Dr. Rupinder? Yeah, so um, I tend to agree with uh, Dr. Rukaya more, and I don't think I would increase the dose. However, I would let her continue uh, taking the same amount of uh, progesterone and then uh, analyze after, uh, re sorry, reevaluate after three months. Because at this point in time, there's nothing that we can do substantial. We cannot send her to an infertility uh, station. They are not going to do anything with the, and you write the word atypical, nobody's going to touch her for anything because she would definitely require some estrogenic stimulation because she's not going to be, and it has to be made very clear to these patients that they are not going to be able to conceive spontaneously. So they should not waste any time trying to do that. They would definitely need assisted reproductive techniques. So for all of that, they would have to be given estrogen and, you know, uh, ovulation induction and all of all that. So uh, we have to give her a very clear report before she actually uh, goes to infertility specialist. And I do not think that adding more progesterone is really going to benefit her too much with her obesity and PCOS. However, if we can give her an intrauterine device, that would definitely take her to places. Right. So I, this is the recommendation that you know we monitor carefully and at least give for six months trial if there is some response and there is no disease progression in uh, three months. So that's what uh, was done. And I personally feel GNRH analog do help. So we actually use in PCOS patients. So um, yeah. So this patient was I advised, as you said, Dr. Rupender, to continue. Uh, and she was then followed up after three months. And at three, six months follow-up, so uh, on uh, ultrasound, there was endometrial hyperplasia and repeat biopsy was done, which showed endometrioid uh, carcinoma grade one. So what? Now she has taken six months of uh, uh, magistral acetate and still there is grade one carcinoma. With the HCI, how is the, how is the symptoms? Is she having amenorrhea? Is she having spotting? Or she's, uh, how is the condition? Uh, so 
Sushmita has to tell this is her case, or maybe Dr. Shahana can tell at this point. Yeah. Now, how will that change anyways, the uh, treatment? If there is a cancer, she cannot become amenorrheic, totally amenorrheic. She will have spotting. Even not cancer can cause little bleeding actually. So no, even, no, no, what no, but that? now we have actually biopsy, which says it's, uh, you know, at six months, biopsy is endometrioid grade one. So the question is, do we continue beyond or do we call it a day at this point? A lady who has received a fairly um, a good dose for six months uh, and there is, apparently there is no response in, uh, in, in on endometrium. So do we continue? But further, so do we change to anything or do we just call it a day and offer our search? No, we are see, 34 we, years we, old, obese, yeah, COS, I think we need to call it a day. Yeah, yeah I think so. If the diagnosis is confirmed, uh, yeah. definitely no point in continuing. Yes, confirmed uh, by uh, Santosh. Confirmed by Santosh, yeah. <laughs> yes. <laughs> you said Santosh. Is very important. Uh, yeah, uh, no, I mean, I meant a, a gynec, you know, oncology pathologist confirmed the diagnosis. The most important thing is pathologist. Most, most important. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes, yes. Yeah, so oncology is all about review. pathology. Yeah, absolutely. So, we can have a slide Dr. review from another center. Uh, maybe we can have a slide review from another center just to corroborate the diagnosis. And uh, we have to keep in mind, she's 34 years old. She's obese. She's got PCOS. She's, you know, we, we, we are not look, looking at a... Uh, a very healthy, fertile, uh, uh, you know, background to give her another chance. I don't think so. Also, we have to remember that not 100% patients will respond to progestogen therapy. So there will be uh, some 10% persistence and 4% progression. So, yes. yes. Okay, so MR was done at this point. Yeah, Amitabh, uh, just one question. Some it question. showed actually there was a tumor uh, in the endometrium along with myometrial invasion. And as per MR, it was more than 50% myometrial invasion. So that's oh the God. problem in, between uh, ultrasound and MRI. So if not done good quality, uh, you know, uh, TVS is not done well, then you can miss myometrial invasion. So definitely now there is no confusion. This lady is, you know, you, we can't continue medical treatment anymore. And she goes for surgery, right? Amita Santosh wanted to say something. He had just... Sorry, sorry. Where is yeah, Amita, Madam, I just wanted to ask one thing. Uh, there are there would be some patients who would say Ki, we want to continue and give it a try. Do you... Uh, no. So then you have to document your opinion. And uh, you have to, you know, there are some, some, some time you have to just your put put your foot down and say at least not definitely not this treatment not this not this case but supposing it was just no no not this treatment what i'm saying if we want to continue we either you know change the treatment to another kind of drug suppose magistral acetate if patient insists we first of all we have to document everything we have to document our opinion we have to document that patient wants to take the risk or whatever and then we of course, if MR is showing more than 50% myometrial invasion, then definitely we are not going to offer any medical treatment, any kind of medical treatment. That's so, so. That's, that's an endometrial cancer invading myometrium. Suppose it right. exists also you have atypical hyperplasia. Hmm. And the patient still insists that I want to take more progesterone and give it a try. So then we can, you know, if we think there is some rational, we can, uh, you know, as we discussed, we can either change to metroxyprogesterone, uh, another kind of thing, or we add... Uh, GNRH analog or we just you know uh, do other things but I think documentation is very important with myometrial invasion I personally have seen a couple of uh, patients who have taken progesterone for a longer time at least and yes but and these are them. responders uh, not you know when there is a response we do give for longer time so if there is some response we would have given but here actually it has kind of progressed uh, on progesterone this has progressed yeah. Yeah, so, so if I might add, even if it is, uh, the report says atypical, it does suggest static disease. At least there is no disease progression. Mm -hmm. And uh, she can be given another chance, I, I think. You, know, you might even want to increase the dosage if you like. But yes, we can still wait. So, but not with uh, MRI suggesting myometrial invasion. Yeah, MRI if there is has atypical, no, no, more than 50% myometrial invasion. So, 
Uh, no, no, not in not this possible. point. Of I was saying before. Not, not in this case. Yeah. Not in this case. We are not yeah. talking about this case. Yeah. We are generally so we are discussing. If there is a partial response at the end of six months, we can continue for another uh, three to six months, actually, as long as there is no disease progression. So the question, uh, laparotomy versus MIS, uh, Dr. Bafna, what would you prefer? I think MIS is a good option to think. Nowadays, I think many people are opting for MIS. And as long as uh, you are not mosculating the specimen, MIS, I think, uh, should be preferred. You should not do an endobag mosculation also. Should be able to remove it uh, intact. And uh, otherwise, you have to do a mini laparotomy. And if you are going to do a mini, mini laparotomy, as well, I think you should choose a open procedure and not go for uh, MIS. Yes, uh, Dr. Janath. Yeah, I also uh, agree with Dr. Bafna. MIS will be suitable for her. And of course, uh, total laparoscopic hysterectomy, BLSO, and surgical staging, including lymphadenectomy. Right. So I think the point is if we have expertise and infrastructure to perform comprehensive surgical staging, uh, in um, we can opt for MIS. If not, then open surgery. See, what is important, we should not compromise on the quality of surgery just uh, for the sake of root. So, and, uh, uh, do you think she's a candidate for sentinel lymph node? Dr. Rupinder, if it's a more than 50% invasion, although it's a grade one endometrium, uh, would you consider her for lymphadenectomy or sentinel lymph node? I would much rather do a, a lymphadenectomy, but then I think I would follow what the, what the people at Mayo do. Do a sentinel lymph node biopsy, but do a, a, do a proper pelvic lymphadenectomy nevertheless. Okay. Yeah. Again, I think um, if you are, you know, if you have a standardized this protocol at your center and if you are routinely doing it, it can be done, but otherwise lymphadenectomy uh, a formal lymphadenectomy is, uh, is, is, is the standard procedure. So, and we, there is no harm doing a lymphadenectomy if we don't have, or if we are not routinely performing sentinel lymphodes. I think I would agree with Amita. Most of the centers would not have a facility for sentinel node biopsy. Yeah. And the complete pelvic node dissection does not cause much mobility. At the most, it may cause mild uh, lower limb edema. And gross edema of the lower limb, very, very rarely you see. And if at all you see gross lymphedema, uh, there has been a comparison between sentinel node biopsy and open uh, surgery. They found that gross edema, if at all occurs, it is same in both open as well as the sentinel node group arm. So I'm not a great fan of sentinel node biopsy. Right. So I think uh, coming to this lymphedema part, part, you know, um, for the last few years, we have stopped removing the lowermost external iliac node. And ever since we have uh, done that, the risk of lymphedema has really gone down, the lymphedema. And uh, that, you know, you will always have an enlarged node, which is close to external femoral type of area where we, you know, invariably get a centimeter or two centimeter large node which never comes positive. I think it essentially drains the lower limb and we don't remove that node nowadays and our lymphedema rate has really gone down. So that's just, uh, you know, my personal uh, yeah. perception. And there is a difference between uh, pelvic lymph node dissection and groin dissection. If you do, right. if you do inguinal node dissection, the chances of lymphedema is much higher. If you do pelvic lymph node dissection, lymphedema, lymphedema is very, very minor. Right. So pelvic and, you know, the node which is close to circumflex in pelvic lymphadenectomy, if we don't remove that node, yeah. then lymphedema rate is much less. So would you consider this lady for ovarian preservation now, you know, considering that MR suggests more than 50% myoinvasion? Yes, I think ovaries, I think, uh, should be preserved, I think, in any patient. Uh, uh, because if imaging is normal, then I think there's no harm in preserving the ovaries, uh, Provided you are ruling out uh, Lynch 2 syndrome and uh, other genetic genetic syndromes, uh, I think there's no harm in preserving the ovaries. But but in this case, myometrial invasion is more than 50 percent. ESGO guidelines suggest that if the invasion is less than 50, then ovary can be preserved. Yeah, yeah, you're right. 
Right. So I think I'll also be a little reluctant because, uh, you know, biologically also her tumor has not really behaved so well. It has progressed right. within six months and uh, more than 50% myoinvasion. I think we may not preserve her ovaries unless patient insists for it. I also won't be too keen to keep her ovaries. And the other thing is we also have to decide what purpose we want to preserve her ovaries. It is, it is only for uh, hormonal function or for you know, subsequent uh, surrogacy. So if that is not the option, then I think there is no point preserving the ovaries. So, yeah. So yes, uh, what Dr. Bapna said, ovarian preservation in young patient can be offered, but in a carefully selected group of patients. So this patient underwent open comprehensive uh, surgery and uh, her post-op histopathology report was grade 2, actually. All this while it was grade 1, now it is grade 2. More than 50% myoinvasion, limb vascular space were positive, ethnexia were uh, unremarkable, and lymph nodes were negative. So now uh, it's essentially stage 1B, grade uh, 2, and LVI positive. So Bhavna, if you are there... Is Dr. Yeah, Bhavna Rai? Yeah. So, um, sorry, we came to you very late. <laughs> no, no, I was a little role immediately. So, over 50% myo invasion with LVI positive makes her high intermediate risk. So, once there is high intermediate risk disease, she definitely requires adjuvant treatment. And because she has undergone a lymph node dissection and adequate LND, so we can offer her adjuvant brachytherapy. One question is uh, to Santosh, uh, when we say uh, LVSI positive, do we take it as substantial positive or even small positive is reported as positive? No, no. When we call it LVSI positive, we generally mean that there we have seen LVSI. So we no, have, seen uh, means even yeah, one per high power yes. field or is it five per? In one vessel. So what we they are saying that the substantial means we this is multifocal or more than five lymph, lymphovascular space invasions. So we have yet to start counting it actually to be very frank because many a times because of the uh, poor fixation and all it becomes very difficult sometimes to uh, pinpoint and count the number of LVC. But now we will begin to start this uh, reporting on substance. Yeah, because now if you see the entire guidelines, actually focal they consider uh, along with negative. Negative, yes. So therapeutic implications are only when uh, there is substantial uh, LVC. So I think it's important. LVSI is always uh, more commonly seen with serious uh, serious cancers or very or grade three endometrial cancers. So grade one and grade two with substantial LVSI would be very very grade one would be very less. You hardly find any case of grade one endometrial cancer with substantial LVSI. No, but here the report is actually LVSI positive. Now the thing is we don't know whether this is just one vessel or five vessels or what. So it's important for pathologists now to, you know, mention is it focal or is it substantial. So, um, Bhavna, you think uh, brachytherapy alone is good here? Yes, brachytherapy alone would be sufficient in her. Okay. Uh, is Jaya there? Uh, yeah, Dr. Amita, I'm there. Yes. So, you think you have any role to play? Yeah, no, I think I'm out of the picture completely because uh, although it does uh, mention adjuvant chemo, you know, for this patient who is grade two and uh, also she's 1B grade two endometroid P53 negative. Yet, uh, and substantial so LVI. Uh, yes, uh, that is there. That is one risk factor, but I'm not sure based on that alone. Like if you see the POTEC 3, Potec 3, stage 1, stage 2, endometroid, uh, I'm not sure that there is really a benefit of adding chemotherapy in that situation. So uh, that is... I, I think we will not really give chemotherapy at this point to uh, this patient. But if you see guidelines, substantial LVI per se, I think is an indication, kind of indication for uh, uh, adjuvant therapy in high intermediate uh, risk, adjuvant chemotherapy. But I agree that the, we will just give her uh, brachytherapy. And also maybe, you know, like if it is a 1B uh, and it is grade 3 and substantial LVSI. So now here this was something which was grade 1, grade 2. 
So I don't know whether we, I mean, there's but no... At the recommendation- same time, Jaya, we have to consider biologically this tumor is not behaving all that, you know, grade one type. The way it has progressed despite progestogen, it suggests something biologically uh, not so good. But of course, uh, I think most of us will not uh, give chemotherapy at least at this point. Okay, so patient received EBRT and she was uh, under regular follow-up. So then she presented again uh, uh, one and a half years after her initial treatment. And now there was, uh, you know, she had blood channel spotting and there was a nodule felt at the vault and biopsy was metastatic adenocarcinoma. One question I have for you, Bhavna, when you give, uh, suppose you give EBRT, uh, yeah. So, do you always club it with brachytherapy or you just give the EBRT alone and you... No. Or do you give boosts to vault in uh, EBRT? No, the only indication where we give EBRT followed by a vault boost is stage 2 disease. Okay. And that too where there is more than 40 percent of stromal invasion. So, like stromal invasion. so, there are the patients where you have to combine both. Otherwise, it increases the toxicity. So uh, the other group of patients where I would good give EBRT only would be where there is more than 50% myometal invasion, the disease is close to the serosa, and the patient has a substantial LVI. And the patient perhaps has not gotten uh, undergone a lymphadenectomy or a incomplete or a, um, inadequate lymphadenectomy, I would say. So those are the patients, um, because we do get these kind of patients who are treated outside um, with the uh, incomplete surgical staging. So these are the patients I would consider for EBRT alone. But a combination of both is usually done when there is cervical involvement. That's the only indication, right? Stage two disease. Yeah, end up increasing the toxicity, which we are not justified in doing so. So now, you know, there is a diagnosis of metastatic adenocarcinoma. So what do we do? We first investigate her the imaging of choice here would be a PET scan or a CCT of the chest, abdomen, and pelvis. I would want to do the systemic evaluation also. I think patient has been advised CCT and report is pending. So let's wait. So what's uh, now? What what suppose there is no disease uh, elsewhere and this is the only site? What will be the treatment? One option is to offer her brachytherapy if the disease is okay. localized to vault. And uh, Jaya, would you consider chemotherapy at this juncture now? If uh, there is uh, only vault disease, but looking so, at the biology of this disease? So if there is vault only disease and uh, they're giving brachytherapy, then I don't have an option of you know giving chemotherapy with that brachy. I mean, giving no, no, With brachy, you can give after brachy? No. Uh, that's a. I would probably keep her under observation only, uh, because this is a comeback after what nine months with a vault only disease. So that is what I would think. Although I, think last I word from Doctor uh, Rupender and Doctor Bafna and Doctor Janatul, and then we we'll close the and Doctor uh, Arokia, and then we we'll close the session. So what uh, ad- treatment will be mm-hmm. offered to her? Consider there is no disease, just located, localized disease at all. Uh, I think a uh, patient has got wall recurrence uh, after external radiotherapy. So I don't know, I want to ask Dr. Bhavna whether brachytherapy alone would help. I'm not sure only brachytherapy would help when you have a wall tumor, gross wall tumor. Uh, Dr. Bhavna, basically she had LVI and uh, the LVI predisposes most to either pelvic lymphadenopathy or local recurrence or parametric involvement. So uh, giving her brachytherapy would give the vault a very high doses. And this is, so, I mean, because of the LVI, we know she has a predisposition to local disease also. So I would still prefer to give her vault brachytherapy and give her a second chance. No, you would, would you like to use brachytherapy or would you like to use interstitial, uh, interstitial brachytherapy? By brachytherapy go, yeah, by brachytherapy, I mean interstitial brachytherapy, okay, okay, not okay, vaginal okay. brachytherapy by sorbo. Sorry, if, yeah. Okay, okay. Okay. I don't know. I, I still might want uh, to give her some chemotherapy. You know, it's, it's uh, definitely an aggressive disease and good surgery has been done. 
and in spite of all of that, it has come back, even if it is just locally, perhaps three cycles of chemotherapy will do her good. Yes, sometimes uh, Dr. Santosh wants to say, and then I'll go on here something. Uh, yeah, just uh, my mind is a very lateral thought. Uh, this patient has come out for one and a half years. We sometimes get to one and a half, two years, two and a half years to all recurrence. Uh, strangely, we never repeat P53. We don't. We, we do only ERPR in, in recurrences, but not P53. So uh, maybe Bafna sir can say because he has extensively reviewed the literature. Uh, is there because in breast cancer and all, for every metastasis which comes up six months later, we do ERPR, CR, but we keep on doing. Uh, Jaya knows it very well. But strangely, yeah. for for endometrial when when it comes after one and a half years, we don't repeat P53 and all because that might be a candidate for chemotherapy and all. Maybe I'm just thinking. I'm just. For the yeah. sake of discussion. Yeah, yeah. Santos, I don't think there's enough data, I think, uh, to look for uh, P53 again, second time. But I think it's a good option, I think, you look for P53, because if P53 is positive, then definitely she would need, require uh, chemotherapy. Yeah, now because of the molecular stuff, sir, because now it is coming in such a big way, I'm sure the recurrences will also, will start doing P53 MSA and all yeah. that. I think so. Can I right, so I think we have very limited literature on this. Dr. So, Dr. Uh, Dr. Uh, something here. Uh, I think Dr. Santosh is very right. And I don't know if uh, Dr. Rupinder can recall, I think there is a patient which was referred from PGI, to Dr. Rupinder, ma'am. This yeah, was yeah. a grade 2 tumor with a vault recurrence. And now that Dr. Santosh mentioned it, I remember, we did a P53 mutation analysis and that came positive. This was a patient of grade 2 carcinoma with a vault recurrence. <laughs> Very well known tumors are clonal, so the tumor yes. comes up after two years think, and is very likely to be totally different from the primary tumor. Think, that is very yes, high especially topic. an early recurrence. So uh, this is a nine-month recurrence. So we did have a similar patient, and just oh, when you were talking time. about it, I remembered this patient uh, particularly, but she was an elderly lady, and so I think P53 does have a role to play. And in that context, uh, ma'am, I'm sure there is a role of chemotherapy also if that comes positive. Yeah, 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 yeah I can comment on that. Yes, yeah. I, I think. Yeah. yeah the so, last thing is that, as Dr. Rupinder mentioned, that sometimes you know these vault recurrences are a little larger, uh, where you feel that you can't do interstitial breakage. So then, generally, we do give them three to four cycles of factory carbo, and it reduces in size. And then uh, sometimes an RT is given. So that is another thing. Yes. Yeah. Because this recurrence is only a one to two centimeters. I think small recurrence, but. Um, yeah, we do do it. So, but for, you know, for a low grade endometrioid adenocarcinoma, actually, it's early recurrence, although we are saying one and a half years, but for endometrium, actually, yeah, it's uh, really I'm early right. recurrence. So, Dr. Janatul and Dr. Rukia? Yes, um, in our country, we, we don't have interstitial brachytherapy for vaginal, for the treatment of this type of recurrence. And as she has symptoms uh, for vaginal bleeding, so I am in favor of chemotherapy, uh, considering the disease biology. Alone or would you not brachytherapy uh, uh, conventional? Uh, 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 no, of course with conventional vaginal brachytherapy. The final word from um, Dr. Rokia after, if she's there. Dr. Rokia Anwar, oh, she left? She left, she left. She left, okay, okay, okay. So I think we are maybe still uh, waiting to get her report, but this is, you know, very unusual case. And uh, right. So thank you very much. And this will wind up the panel discussion. And thank you on, on behalf of all our panelists and thank organizers for the opportunity. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.